It is my pleasure to introduce two-time world champion and co-founder of ReInc, Tobin Heath. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> All right, Tobin. Um, in March of 2019, you and members of the U.S. Women's National Team sued the U.S. Soccer Federation for gender discrimination and unequal pay, causing a major ripple effect that we are still fighting today. Tell us about that. Okay, I will. <laughs> but before we get into it, we, we should recognize that you also played soccer. Oh, okay. For Stanford. <laughs> It's okay. So I was wondering, no, it's not about Jennifer, yes. is it, what, what was the, the name? What was your, your athlete name? My athlete name? Yeah. Well, I was Seaball. I just called me Seaball. We had three, well, anyway. I played at Stanford and <laughs> okay, I'm the Seabull, let's do this. Team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Jenny Seaball. Um, uh, no, um, super cool. But you're, you're just a legend. I want, <laughs> back to you. See, I back really you. cut through here. <laughs> um, but it's, it's actually really cool because, you know, sports, we're, we're going to get into that later. Okay, you. You are, <laughs> you are our rock star here. Um, t tell us about this whole journey that you've been on. Well, um, I don't recommend suing your employee and playing for them at the same time. No. <laughs> I think that could be the, one of the greatest lessons it made for some awkward um, interactions in the meal room yeah. and in passing, like, hey. Yeah. <laughs> um, but look, this was um, an incredible honor. I was fortunate enough. I've, I've played for the US Women's National Team uh, since I was a kid. I've been a part of the system. I was very young when I um, first started with the first team, just a teenager. And I remember each kind of cycle of our collective bargaining agreements, which is where you know we fight for, for our worth, or at least we, we tried to. Um, I remember being part of these rooms where each time, you know, obviously we were like, here, this is what you're gonna get paid. And we were like, wow, that's uh, nowhere near our worth. And we would be collectively in this room together and we would be like, we're gonna strike. That's, that's kind of like the only leverage we knew we had. Mm -hmm. Um, but that would obviously take away from us doing the playing, which was our dream and, and our goals and our ambition. Um, so each four years, you know, we would get the bravado of the U.S. Women's National Team and say, we're going to strike. And we'd all be pumped up about it. And essentially, we would settle for what was inflation. Um, it was very discouraging. Um, but at the same time, these were conversations that led to the biggest decision, which was then to sue our employee. But that, this didn't happen overnight. And I think for most of you, um, this was layered on frustrations and meetings where we were constantly battling for our worth until what I would call the perfect storm happened. Mm -hmm. I think we needed to have, we should have done the strike for you, like the walkout, like the women in Iceland. Maybe, maybe that's planting a seed here for all of us in the room. Okay, just, I'm gonna get in trouble, sorry about that. Um, but, okay, so let, I, you know, one of the reasons I actually took the title first partner um, rather than first lady was to center the importance and strength of partnership. You play a team sport, you know this strength well. Why did you all take on this fight as a team, as a collective? I mean, it, it, it's obvious, but how did it help? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it was the power of the team that made this, this possible. Um, and especially this, this specific group of women. Um, there's this thing that happens where before like a world championship, and when I say world championship, we're, we're referring to the Olympics and the World Cup. Before this happens, it's a dog fight. We're talking about, you know, the best, well, the most competitive sport for women in this country, for girls in this country is soccer. <clears throat> and it's a dog fight to even get to practice on the US Women's National Team. Mm -hmm. And what happens though is right before, right when a world championship roster is announced, you go from these individuals that are literally trying to kill each other for a roster spot to a team. Yeah. And this collective group had been a team for a while. It was a team that lost in the 2011 final. Everyone forgets that because you only remember the winning. It was the same group that won 2015 and the same group that won 2019. So this was a team. This was a collective group of women that knew each other's strengths extremely well. And what we did was 
We knew each other's strengths both on and off the field. And with our pay equity lawsuit, we made sure we were putting each other in positions of strength. We had been doing this forever on the field. You know, not everyone can be the person out in front of the camera. Not every person should be making the decisions behind the scenes, doing the creative things. We all knew each other's superpowers and really that really transformed this into a very powerful fight because we put each other in positions to seed in our pay equity lawsuit. Not as, as soccer players, but truly as people fighting uh, for change. So uh, sports in the corporate world have many parallels. Um, I recently learned at a um, women in sports event in Vegas that 94% of women in the C-suite played competitive sports at some point in their life, and 52% of women in the C-suite played college sports. I think that's interesting. Oh my um, gosh, it's incredible. Right? Yeah. Um, but yet, many women in corporate America are afraid to speak up. So what's your advice to them about how to push past that fear and find strength in allyship and the sisterhood? Yeah, I mean, it shows that sports give women incredible tools, mm -hmm. like tools that translate then to other fields that they go into. Um, I, I spoke to you that there's uh, something brewing in the women's sports world that we call the women's sports mafia. And it really <clears throat> is these women that are in C-suite positions, in leadership positions, decision-making positions that have that understanding of sports, that understanding of teamwork, of camaraderie. Um, and we call it the women's sports mafia because they've all kind of recognized this vehicle of sports, how they, they can be useful to it. Um, and that's what I would say is find your team. You know, for, for us as women, we've been taught this idea of scarcity mm -hmm. because for, for most women, you know, there's only one seat at the table for you at the top, right? So you had to fight to get there and, and you're really proud. You're this one person that got that there. Like what an incredible honor but there's so much scarcity at the top, and that's what we're kind of taught to believe about these positions, that there's scarcity in it. And when I look out into this room, I see abundance. Because what we do is we take that one seat and we turn it into two seats, into three seats. And then we bring it together all here, and there is so much power in the collective. And, and I don't know many jobs that are gendered like the US Women's Nash Team, where you get you know, 23 strong, apologetic, confident women coming together. We don't suffer from these same things because that is, that's our table. It's 23 women. Um, and I think it's given us an incredible place of where we're almost living in the future that we're trying to create for others mm -hmm. are these tables that, that look like this. And I would be very remiss if I, if I didn't share this here on this stage is when we were talking about pay equity as a group, it was an issue that affected all of us, right? We were, we were 23 women. We all wanted to get paid our worth. But the thing that I want to really celebrate, and I hope that if we have fans of the U.S. Women's Ash team in this room, is actually, <laughs> is actually something that maybe not every woman on this team, which is celebrating that this right now is the most diverse team the U.S. Women's Ash team has ever seen. Oh, we, we need to talk about racial equality, yeah. especially in sports. Yeah. And right now, this is something that should be celebrated in the same way, lifted on these platforms of the same way and the same importance because we're living in a place where not only are there 23 women, but there's 23 diverse, powerful women at this table. Um, and that has to be celebrated. Oh, I love that. That's great. <clears throat> So the World Economic Forum estimates that it will take 257 years <laughs> to close Exciting. the gender pay gap. 257 more years, come on. Um, however, the, the gender pay gap is just one part of a larger systemic issue that includes a patriarchal imbalance and structure, um, which is holding us back in a myriad of ways. Can you talk about the larger issue and how we can reimagine and reinvent spaces like corporate America that were not designed for and by women? Yeah, absolutely. Um, at our like kind of highest level, we actually we had the, this big thing called the World Cup this past summer, 
and there was a celebration because, um, <laughs> yeah, that thing. Um, there was a celebration because, you know, the women were going to be making more money this, this time around. Yay, awesome. Um, but what wasn't talked about enough is the gender pay gap is getting bigger. Yeah. So as much as we're making more, you know, our male counterparts are making way more, um, which is a problem. So, you know, the women were making 25 cents to the, the dollar of their men counterparts in, in the World Cup. Um, yeah, and, and it, it can be extremely, extremely discouraging at times. Um, and like you said, 200 years, we're, we're not even going to see it. But to build structures, this is what I want to say, is we would walk into these rooms and you know our our president. I'm not going to make name names. Not not that president, but our, our U.S. soccer president at the time. You know would say something like, you know, the market realities are such that you are not deserving of being paid what you think you are worth. Why are the market realities are of such? What comes first, investment or revenue? That's right. Because women, and, and we've spoken about this, women only receive money on past performances, but men receive money on potential. That's right. So when we talk about the women's sports, sports world, yeah. when we talk about this, this new women's, this new sports house that's being designed, I mean, I'm not gonna gender it because we're greater than gender as, as women's sports. Um, we talk about creating new revenue streams. Let's go out and build it. You know, if, if some structure is not going to fit us, let's go out and build a new structure because we believe in a diverse and equitable world because that is a world that is better for everyone, not just for us as women, for everyone. Um, the state of California is leading the charge from a state level on pay equity with our Equal Pay Pledge and other initiatives, um, much in the same way your team did in sports. Can you talk about what's next in terms of equal pay for you all, but also about Re-Inc and your approach in our fight for gender equity. Yeah, I mean, there's so many ways you can kind of slice it, and I think everyone here is going at it from their passions and their perspectives to push the needle. Um, I, I think it's funny that while we were kind of like, everybody talks about effort, like blood, sweat, tears, you know, um, we were quite literally like, you know, putting the ball in the back of the net for, for, for pay equity, which is kind of funny. Uh, <laughs> uh, but for what's next, um, I'm passionate about building new structures that look and feel like us. With our company, Re-Inc., this past summer, we launched a media division. Um, traditional media hasn't um, really made space for women's no. sports. And, and look, we have like the likes of the NFL and the NBA fighting for market share in this sports structure in traditional media. Um, and, you know, I'm not really interested in fighting in these sandboxes. I think it will take more than 270 years if we try to play in the yeah, same sandbox. I think you're right. Um, so, so how can we build these new structures and, and actually make them feel more like us? Because I think those are more effective structures. I mean, look, if sports could redo the playbook, if they had the opportunity of women's sports right now, they absolutely would. Men's sports is deeply rooted on structures that we're honestly not, not very proud of. Um, where women's sports is progressive, it's forward thinking, it's inclusive, it's powerful. I honestly think women's sports is the future of all sports. And Ooh, where- I love that, that's awesome. Yeah, and where, where we're now playing our part is, you know, we started Remedia to reimagine the way women are seen and experienced in sports. Because while we were doing the sports, we were seeing how other people were representing us. And as an athlete, you know, you can only change so much at, at once, right? As an athlete, we'd just be frustrated with it because it didn't sound like us, it didn't look like us, it didn't feel like us. Um, so we saw a unique opportunity uh, this summer with the World Cup, you know, having, you know, not played in now a World Cup for over, well, 
that was my first World Cup I hadn't played in for uh, over a decade. And I saw a unique opportunity to take a frustration and turn it into an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And that was ReMedia. We hit it off with the recap show. And it was all around this idea of gal culture, mm -hmm. which people have kind of coined the antidote to bro culture. Mm -hmm. We've all adopted or opted into this culture of sports that actually isn't representative of us as, as women at all. And for the first time, we were able to actually speak about our culture, show our culture. And it's powerful because it isn't the sports, right? It's what is it, conversations around these tables this whole time. It's what unites us all. Um, and the conversations that, using the vehicle of sport for the conversations that, that really matter, like this one, like women's health, which you know we could get into a whole, that's next. Um, so many different uh, topics that we can explore and we can highlight about art culture um, that makes it unique. And that's gal culture, you're all a part of the gals. Uh, if you can see it, you can be it. Thank you for being it. Thank you for leading the charge. Thank you for calling all, on all of us to partner with you, to support you, I do believe that women in sports is the future of gender equity. I really do. I think we all need to invest in you guys. Thank you. Thank You're you. You're remarkable. You're Good remarkable. Luck. We're so glad. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.